this time in the ABS hangar. How slips and skids differ and why knowing the difference is vitally important. Our presenter this time is Mike Friel, U.S. Army aviator retired and BPPP instructor. Hello and welcome. I'm Mike Friel. I'm an instructor pilot with the American Bonanza Society's Beach Pilot Proficiency Program, the BPPP program. I'm here tonight with fellow ABS member Dave Tabachnik. Dave is a commercial instrument pilot and a 2017 recipient of the American Bonanza Society's Airmanship Award. You may not see much of Dave, but he's here somewhere in the ether of cyberspace and he's putting this whole program together. So thank you, Dave. Today we're going to discuss slips and skids. I'm going to try and make the program concise but comprehensive. We'll follow the FAA's uh, levels of learning as we go through the program. Those levels, as you remember, are rote, understanding, application, and correlation. Okay, for the rote portion, let's get into some uh, definitions. If we look in Merriam-Webster Dictionary, we'll see numerous def definitions for slips and skids. None of those definitions are appropriate for our discussion. We're going, to, we're going to define six terms. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with these terms. Uh, relative wind, coordinated flight, uncoordinated flight, standard rate turn, slip, and skid. The relative wind is the wind that creates lift. It's the movement of the airfoil, not the movement of the air mass that generates the lift. The relative wind is always opposite to the direction of the movement of the airfoil. Brings us to coordinated flight. In coordinated flight, the tail of the aircraft follows the same path through the air mass as the nose of the aircraft. On to uncoordinated flight. Uncoordinated flight, the tail of the aircraft does not follow the nose of the aircraft through the air mass. The tail parallels the nose, but it's either off to the right or off to the left. Moving on to standard rate turn. Standard rate turn is a Two minute turn. In two minutes, you would complete a 360 degree turn if you're in a standard rate turn. That makes a one minute turn for 180 degrees or three degrees per second. We use a turn coordinate or the old turn bank, but we'll stay with the turn coordinate for this discussion. The turn coordinator has a little airplane in it. Off to either side of the little airplane, you'll see two white index marks. If the wing, airplane wing is aligned with the upper two index marks, there's no turn, there's no rate of turn, no heading change. If one of those wings dips down to the lower two, either of the lower two white index marks, that indicates a standard rate turn. At the bottom of the turn coordinator, there's an inclinometer. There's two black index marks in the center of the inclinometer. The area between those index marks represents the nose of the aircraft. There's a black ball in the inclinometer. When that black ball is in between those two index marks, the tail is following the nose. If the, if the tail moves out either to the right or to the left, the tail is no longer following the nose and you're in, in uncoordinated flight. For our standard rate turn, we're going to stay with coordinated flight for a minute. The airspeeds we fly below 250 knots, we have a rule of thumb that the uh, angle of bank required for a standard rate turn is 15 degree, 15 percent of the airspeed. So if we're doing 100 knots, the easiest way to determine a 15 degree bank is drop to zero, you got 10, take half of 10 is 5, 15 degrees. 15 degree bank, 160 knots, 16 plus 8, 24, 24 degree bank. 200 knots, 20 plus 10, 30 degree bank. That's a rule of thumb for a general, generally close estimate of what the angle of bank needs to be for your standard rate turn at that particular airspeed. Okay, what's a slip? A slip 
is a flight maneuver in which the angle of bank is too great for the rate of turn, the rate of turn or heading change. Angle of bank is too great for our rate of turn or our heading change. We use opposite rudder to go into a slip. You turn one way, push the rudder the other way, nose of the aircraft moves the other way. That slows down the turn. Tail moves towards the lowered wing. Brings us onto a skid. A skid is just the opposite of a slip. The rate of turn or rate of heading change is too great for the angle of bank. The pilot will put the rudder into the direction of turn. The black ball in, this, in the inclinometer moves away from the lowered wing. The tail of the aircraft moves towards the raised wing in this case. Let's go on to the understanding. For the understanding portion, we'll take those terms that we just reviewed and we'll look at them from the pilot's perspective in the cockpit. We'll understand how they're affecting our flight. We use the uh, analog six-pack. Uh, for the six-pack, we have the uh, airspeed, the attitude indicator, the altimeter, the uh, turn coordinator, heading indicator, and a VSI. So as a pilot, if you're flying an aircraft and you're in a coordinated standard rate turn, let's use 100 knots so we have something to shoot at but you could use any airspeed or any bank angle that was appropriate. But for us, we'll say the airspeed indicator indicates 100 knots. The bank angle, we're going to go to 15 degrees, 15% 15 of 100. Altimeter is going to stay constant. The turn coordinator, the little airplane wing is going to dip down to that lower index mark, and it's going to stay there for the standard rate. The inclinometer, the tail is going to be, or the black ball, is going to be between those two index marks, so the tail will be following the nose. The heading indicator is going to be moving at 3 degrees per second. Vertical speed will stay constant. The relative wind is going to meet the aircraft head on. It's going to be minimum uh, drag from the fuselage and both wings are going to uh, meet the relative wind equally, creating equal lift on both. Let's look at a slip. If we go into a slip, we'll look at the analog gauges again. The airspeed indicator may be a little less than reliable as the uh, relative wind has the possibility of pressurizing the static ports. And those pressurized static ports can cause erratic or unreliable airspeed indications. Uh, the attitude indicator is whatever bank the pilot puts in, we're going to use 15 degrees. Uh, the altitude will remain constant. The turn coordinator. Turn coordinator, if we start it in a standard rate turn, it's going to go to the standard rate turn. As we enter the slip, we're going to apply rudder opposite the turn. Or our rate of turn, rate of heading change, is going to decrease. So that little airplane in the turn coordinator is going to come back up towards the level and may even approach the level if you put enough rudder in. Vertical speed stays constant. So, so the ball in the inclinometer is going to be offset towards the uh, bank that you put in and the rate of turn is going to be less than standard rate. The tail is not following the nose, it's paralleling the nose on the same side as the lowered wing. So let's look at a skid. The skid is going to be just the opposite. We can start by entering a standard rate turn if we want, and then we're going to apply rudder into the turn. Airspeed, again, may be unreliable for the same reasons. Angle of bank, whatever we input. Let's do our 15 degrees again. The altitude is going to stay constant. Turn coordinator. Now the turn coordinator, since we're increasing our heading change or our rate of turn with rudder, that little airplane is going to dip down and can even dip below that uh, standard rate turn mark. Heading indicator is going to be going to be changing at a speed faster than three degrees per second. Depending on the more rudder we put in, the more it's going to change. VSI is going to change, stay constant. Uh, we're going to see the ball now in the inclinometer go out away from the uh, 
direction of the lowered wing. The relative wind is going to be meeting the aircraft on the side with the raised wing now. The fuselage is going to be blocking some of the relative wind from getting the full effect on the lowered wing. Okay, we've gone through the rope definitions. We've gone through the understanding. We know what to look at in the cockpit as a pilot. Let's go to the application. Why do we want to skid or slip? Let's go to slips first. There are two types of slips that we use. First is a forward slip, which we use to lose altitude. Then there's a side slip. We use the side slip for crosswind landings. Uh, the forward slip, the longitudinal axis of the aircraft is not aligned with the ground track. We're doing that so we can create a lot of drag by facing the fuselage into the wind, into the relative wind. We use that to uh, lose altitude rapidly without an increase in airspeed. And we'd want to do that for an emergency descent. If we have a field close in below us, we want to get too quickly. Or we use uh, forward slips also for uh, confined areas. If, if there are significant obstacles at the approach end to a, possibly a short runway, you'd want to do a forward slip to get down to where you can land normally. One administrative note on slips. Remember to adhere to your POH limitations on slips. It's either 20 seconds or 30 seconds, depending on the baffling in your fuel tanks. And also when I discuss using slips for emergency descent, I'm not talking emergency descent from the flight levels. I'm talking that last few hundred feet when you're trying to maintain an approach airspeed so you can clear some obstacles to make a landing area. A side slip, when we use a side slip. In a side slip, the aircraft's longitudinal axis is aligned with the aircraft's ground track. And we use that for landing in a crosswind so that we can land without imposing any significant side loads on the landing gear. I've been asked several times, how come when you fly with the nose of the aircraft pointed forward over the ground, it's a side slip? And when you fly with the nose pointed sideways over the ground, it's a forward slip. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's just the way they named them. Uh, stay with that. Skids. Let's talk about skids. Unless you want to get out of the particular spot in the airspace that you're in currently in a very sudden and abrupt maneuver, there's nothing good about a skid. So for us in the pitch, Piston Beach world, we should just avoid skids. Okay, now we're ready to move on to correlation. Correlation will take everything we talked about so far and correlate it all together. And we'll be able to apply these now to all our aspects of flying, not just slips and skids. Many of us have been taught, myself included, that the uh, loss of control accidents associated with uh, skids and stalls are occurring on that base to final turn. We've been taught that if there's a tailwind on the base, we have a tendency to overshoot the final, so we're trying to correct for that by adding extra rudder into the turn. And that puts us into, as we learned, a, a skid. The skid at the low airspeed is a dangerous maneuver. It can, it can develop into a stall and a spin. Tom Turner did a 10-year study of beach piston airplane accidents by reviewing NTSB reports from 2003 through 2012 in that study, he learned that that base to final loss of control is not the case with our Beechcraft pistons. There were zero reports of Beechcraft base to final turn accidents during that period. To learn more about that, watch The Truth About Stalls in the uh, BPPP online recurrent. One of many good programs in there recurrent section. About 70% of the stalls in Beach Twins and Seagulls are power on stalls. Power on stalls is, is very telling. It's telling us that we're getting laxed with our airmanship. We've got to coordinate our hands and our feet a little better. 50% of the stalls happen on takeoffs, 
go-arounds, or missed approaches. What's in common there is we got high power, high angle of attack, slow airspeed, and you, you've got the uh, left turning tendencies to contend with. So again, that's airmanship we need to work on there. About one third of our stalls are occurring after a power failure. What's very telling about that is 60% of those in singles and 40% of those power failures in twins are due to fuel mis mismanagement. So if we could learn to manage the fuel better and learn to coordinate our hands and our feet a little better, I think we could uh, really improve the accident record. I've always been told to be very careful when someone states, watch this in the aircraft. We're not in an aircraft, so I'm going to say, watch this. This is our uh, beach simulator. I can, uh, I can make it a V-tail if you prefer, but uh, it's easier for me to just keep it a no-tail simulator. So as we fly our aircraft in coordinated flight into the relative wind, we reduce the drag because we have low profile facing the relative wind. We have equal lift on both wings as they meet the relative wind head on. So let's look, let's look at a slip. Let's put the right wing down and then we'll add left rudder now we have the lowered wing leading, the raised wing trailing, some of the relative wind is blocked from the trailing wing by the fuselage. So if we, if we should increase the angle of attack to a critical angle and the wing stalls, that raised wing is going to stall first. And what's going to happen? It's going to fall. And when it falls, it's going to tend to bring the aircraft back to level flight. The pilot's going to have time to correct, and it's, it's a pretty mundane maneuver. Let's look at a, a skid on the other hand. We'll put that same right wing down, but this time instead of adding left rudder, we're going to add right rudder and increase the turn. So now what happens? Now the raised wing is leading, the lowered wing is trailing. The fuselage is blocking some of the relative wind from effectively producing lift on the uh, trailing wing. So if we should increase our angle of attack too much and enter a stall, now what happens? The lower wing stalls and whoop, away we go. That's not good. There's nothing good about that. This concludes our presentation. Dave and I hope you enjoyed it. Safe flying.